the topic of the day is economic slowdown. I think this is on people's minds quite a bit these days with everything that's going on. And you know, so I was asked to uh, write an article about this in the Waterwell Journal and also do this presentation. And um, a, another title for this could be three things you can do in order to not only survive but thrive in an economic slowdown. So I like to focus on things that uh, we can take action on. So uh, that's what it's all about. And a quick note before we get too deep into it is like what exactly is an economic slowdown? And I think you could argue that an economic downturn is very psychological. Um, I, I got this idea from a guy named Grant, Card, uh, Grant Cardone. So Grant Cardone is one of the top sales trainers in the world now. And he really came up uh, during the recession in 2008. And he uh, came out with a book back then. It's called uh, Sell or Be Sold. And in the beginning of that book, he talks about how most people, when you know the economy turns bad and the news is bad and everything's bad, most people really take that as a signal for them to contract their spending and to you know be afraid and to to just kind of let it steamroll them. But the fact is, a lot of wealth is created during economic downturns, and while most companies are cutting costs, there's going to be those companies out there that uh, are doubling down on their efforts, making investments in their marketing in their companies, and really establishing a larger foothold in their market. So that by the time the economy turns back around, as it always does, you know they're in, they've they've taken over their market. And so um, I would just keep that in mind. Like never let fear just steamroll you like there's always opportunities and just because the people on the TV are saying that the sky is falling it doesn't mean that there's not things we can do and not actions we can take to even better our situation so I always say plan for the worst hope for the best and I'm doing my best to be prepared mentally to double down my efforts uh, when the the next economic downturn happens whether it's starting now or whether it comes in the future, it will come someday. So it's best to uh, be prepared for that. So if you have a customer, you have a business. I would argue that acquiring customers is the most important thing when it comes to running a business. If you don't have any customers, then you're dead in the water. Um, and you know, I know there's a lot of issues going on now, like with supply chains and regulations and all these other things. But those wouldn't be problems if you didn't have a customer that you're trying to solve a problem for. So as long as you can keep customers coming in, then you have a chance. If you don't have any customers coming in, then you'll be like my family's uh, construction company was back in 2008 when the housing crisis happened. Um, we had no customers, so we had to find other ways to make it work. We ended up doing uh, trash outs, which is going into foreclosed homes for banks and cleaning out all the stuff that people left behind and getting them ready to be sold. And it wasn't very profitable, but it kept food on our table. And the things that I'm going to talk about in this presentation are things that I'm going to be doing differently the next time around so that we don't have to resort to doing things like that. Um, I'd like to keep the profit coming in. So uh, the main goal, keep customers coming in. And if you can do this during good times, then you can probably do this during bad times. So this presentation will be broken up into three areas. And these are three things that you can do. You can be easy to find online. You can know how to buy customers. And you can know how to use your numbers. If you can do these three things, then most likely customer acquisition will not be a problem for you. So let's start out with being easy uh, to be found online. So it's easy for me to talk about this kind of stuff because this is my uh, world day in and day out. My company, we specialize in making sure that our clients can be found online, that they can keep acquiring customers. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. And in order to do that, we need to understand where people are looking online. And for the most part, they're using Google. So let's just take a quick look at Google. 
So I just I just did a uh, an example search on Google real quick. Um, I searched for a remodeling contractor in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, because Coeur d'Alene is where I'm at, and a remodeling a search for a remodeling contractor is just a good way, a reliable way to uh, uh, show you what the different parts of Google search are. So at the top here, we've got the ads. These are Google ads. Uh, these companies are paying Google to be here. That's why it says ad right here in really small print. They don't want to make it too obvious that it's an ad, but they have to let you know somehow. Below that, we have Google Maps. So this is Google's form of local search. So whatever you find in the Google Maps area of the search page, these are going to be local businesses. You can see that by the map. You can click on the map and open this up and see even more places. Um, Google, uh, Google Maps is the, the number one place people are looking to find local businesses. Of the dozens of clients that we work with on a regular basis, over half of their customers find them through Google Maps. And that's because A, uh, people know that this is where they'll find local businesses. If you look up here in the ads, you'll see Angie, you see Home Advisor, you see Pal and Sons. These are not local businesses. These are all national companies that do their best to collect contact information of people and then sell it to actual companies. And people kind of catch on to that and so they know that if they just skip to the Google, uh, Google Maps, they're gonna be more likely to actually find what they're looking for, which is like a local contractor or a local business of some sort. Um, and below that we've got what's called the Google organic search. So this is what Google used to look like back before Google Ads and Google Maps came around. Um, but it's still a really important part of search. And if you look closely, you'll notice the same thing that I just pointed out about the ads, is you've got all of these, these national companies, House, Yelp, Angie, Better Business Bureau, Thumbtack. None of these are local contractors in our area. These are all national companies doing their best to collect contact information and find a way to sell it to actual contractors like this company right here. So those are the three areas of Google search. You've got the ads, you've got Google Maps, and you've got the organic search. And you can be found in all three of these places. And if you can, if you can figure out how to be found in all three places, that's about the best that you can do on Google. And I'm going to use Google for all of my search engine examples because Google's used by over 90% of people and you know it's it's so common that the the term Google is ubiquitous with searching online for something. So if you can figure out how to be in all three places then you're doing pretty good. And the way that you can be found on Google is through your website. Your website is the tool for this. So let's talk about website for a minute. So in a nutshell your website has three responsibilities. Number one, it needs to allow you to be found by people searching on Google. If 90% of people are searching on Google, then it's a good idea if you can be there. It's kind of like the pre-internet equivalent of being located on Main Street. Uh, location, location, location is still true today, except everybody is looking online instead of walking down the street. And you could say that using Google ads is kind of like you uh, using a billboard or running a billboard you know it's it's putting yourself where people are looking so number one is be found number two is to show people the information they're looking for uh, in order to buy make a buying decision so this one seems kind of obvious um, but I think it's worth pointing out because your website is about your customers a lot of business owners or, or managers think that their website is about them but it's it's about the customers and so understanding what kind of information they're looking for where they're coming from like in their perspective uh, what kind of things that they're concerned about in order to make a buying decision um, you know things like that if you can put yourself into their shoes then it, it'll be clear what kind of stuff should be on your website so just having the the right information is key and then giving people a means to contact you. So you might have the best website on the planet and it might be splattered all over Google, 
But if it's not clear and obvious and easy for people to get a hold of you, then it's probably not doing anything for you. So if your website can accomplish these three things, then you're in pretty good shape. So let's dive a little bit further into each one of these because there's a, there's a lot that goes into this and it's important. And you might not you might not remember everything I'm saying or a lot of this might not even make sense, but if one or two things can stick out to you and and give you an idea on something that you can take action on, then I think that's that's what can be gained from this. And this is going to be recorded, so you can always go back and and watch this again. So um, being found, your website's number one job. So a lot of people will reach your website from all different places. Some people will hear of you from a friend and they'll go online and they'll look you up. They'll see it on your business cards, on your trucks. Um, they'll, they'll find a way to seek you out. And so that's one way. Another way is on the Google search. And so those are people that might probably haven't heard of your company before, but they understand what it is they're looking for, what kind of service. And so they go to Google, they look for that in their local area, and then you show up. And you're, it's a, the website is so important in this regard because as far as Google's concerned, like you are your website. That's how Google understands what your company is, what you do, and all of that kind of stuff. And if you want to be found on Google, like most companies do, then you got to understand how, like, what what is Google's purpose here? What what are they trying to do? Why would Google show your website to people that are searching? And at the end of the day, Google's used by so many people because it's the best search engine. But what makes it the best search engine? It's that it shows people the best search results. Like Google is so good at understanding what we're looking for and showing us, you know, the right things that everybody uses it and so the key to the key to having your website show up is making it the best thing to show people like be exactly what people are looking for and google will reward you by showing you and there's so many you know, there's this whole like field of career paths or expertise or whatever you want to call it called search engine optimization of people trying to game the system and be found on Google. Um, but at the end of the day, if you can just understand that you need to be the most relevant, uh, the best search result for the people that are actually finding your website, 90% of the work will be done. And you only have to be better than your competitors. So go look at what they're doing and try to provide a better experience than they are for the people reaching your website. And Google will likely reward you. Uh, with with showing you up at the top and if you can't get that to work you can always just pay for Google Ads and and Google will stick you right up here at the top all you have to do is pay them every time someone clicks on that ad um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later so once your websites being found it needs to provide the right information um, I dove into that a little bit before but basically people you know depending on what you're offering they want to see certain things. So I know from for remodeling, like what, what I've done most of my life, people want to see a lot of pictures of that because it's a very visual thing. Um, for water-related stuff, it's more of like understanding whatever problem they're having or helping them understand what the problem is and making it easy for them to take action to figure out what the solution is. Um, so you know, if you can figure out how to do that, and make it easy to contact you, you know, that's, that's the only purpose your website needs to, uh, needs to accomplish for, for this stage. And a really critical thing here is just looking professional. And I mean, one way to gauge if your website is professional or not is like, how proud are you to show it to people? If you are super proud and you want to tell everybody about it and you want everyone to go there, then it's probably looking pretty professional. But that's really just about attention to detail, you know, just having it look professional. It's a, it's a subjective thing, but, you know, you, you should be able to tell. Um, and these days, most websites are looking pretty good. Uh, the number three. Number three job is letting them become a customer. So once people found you, once they've 
um, determine that you're trustworthy, that you're professional, that you solve the problem that they have, then you just need to provide them a way to become a customer. And there's a ton of ways to do this. Um, most commonly, I use contact forms because I get to control what happens when someone fills out a contact form. I can send them to another page afterwards. I can get an alert on my phone, however I want to do it. Um, but you, you, can, you can either choose to give them tons of options. You can let them email, text, call, contact form, whatever. Or you can just give them one option. And the reason you might do that is if you are really busy, then you probably don't want people contacting you eight different ways. And uh, one way we did this at my family's construction company a few years ago was uh, with a calendar. So somebody would fill out the contact form on our website and it would automatically send them to another page that had a calendar where they could pick a time uh, for us to actually come meet with them. So it was like they were skipping ahead and instead of leaving us a message and having us call them back in order to schedule this appointment, they got to just schedule their appointment right then and there. And we made it so they can only schedule them on Fridays in between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. And we would only have four per week. So if this week was full, they would be directed to the next week. And that was the only option that we gave them because we were so busy that it, it was just easier for us to do it this way. And actually our customers really liked this because they came to our site, they found what they were looking for, they contacted us and they got their appointment set up all in like five or 10 minutes and they didn't have to play phone tag, they didn't have to drag on this this thing, it just got all got taken care of in a few minutes. So um, the key is that having a way to people for people to contact you. Believe it or not, I've come across a lot of uh, websites for clients that they, the contact form's broken or their phone number's non-existent. Like there's just no way for people to contact them. And so it's no wonder that nobody ever contacts them through their website. So the three jobs are accomplished when people are finding you online, when they're finding the information they need and when they're contacting you. The bottom line is how many customers are you getting through your website? If it's working, it's working. If it isn't, it isn't. Um, but the bottom line is you want you want the phone ringing, you know, you want people coming in. So uh, we that's number one. Be easy to find online. Um, I mean, there's there's definitely a lot more to that, but you it's it's imperative for every business that's in this for the long term to have that baseline established where people can just find you online. Um, maybe it's competitive, maybe. Uh, only some people find you, but it, this level of marketing, it provides a baseline of people finding you all the time. And if you're not taking advantage of this, then the other means of marketing will A, not be as effective and B, just be um, more expensive. Because just having a website that's found that produces customers is by far the most profitable way to acquire customers online. So once you have that baseline established, the next thing to do is know how to buy customers. So like, what if there was a store that you could go to and you could just buy customers? How much would you be willing to spend to acquire a customer? Um, that's a good question and, and one that a lot of people can't answer because they don't really think about it this way. Um, and so this is all about advertising. Um, putting yourself out there, uh, paying to be seen by, by people. That's been, it's a way of acquiring customers that's as old as time. And there's two main ways to do it online today. That's search ads and social media ads. And since these companies are so huge and the names of them are ubiquitous with these terms, we'll just call them Google ads and Facebook ads. Um, and I could probably sense some hesitancy in some people's minds like, oh, you know, Google ads doesn't work or Facebook ads, we tried that, it doesn't work. The fact is that Google's made a, almost a trillion dollars in the last decade from Google ads and they wouldn't be making so much money if these ads weren't working for tons of people. And same with Facebook. Um, but it is really easy to, to waste a bunch of money on them. and. 
uh, that's why I think it's good to figure out how to do this now instead of waiting until you, ha you have to figure out how to do it later. So first let's talk about Google Ads. So Google Ads, you know, if we look at Google again, we have a search bar. I'm searching for something very specific in my local area. And that is the advantage of Google Ads is you're showing your company, you're showing your ad or your offer to people that are specifically looking for what you have to sell. And at the end of the day, you know, whatever customers you acquire through advertising, you're spending some percentage of your revenue to acquire those customers. And however much you spend to get one customer is what we call cost per acquisition. Um, and the end goal is to find out what your average cost per acquisition is and what your um, average profit is and be able to take small actions and tweak things to reduce how much you pay to acquire a customer and to increase the amount that you profit. And you just tweaking those two dials is how you really get a marketing strategy to work well. Um, but it's not something that most companies get to because um, they either don't invest in marketing or advertising or they, they don't really track their numbers. So we will also talk more about numbers here in a moment. But the key right, right at this point is that Google is all about search. People are searching for something. They have the intent to buy already and that's the advantage of advertising on these places. Facebook ads are very different. If, if you've used Facebook before, you know that you're not really looking for anything. You're just scrolling through, kind of looking at whatever it shows you. And you know, people that see your ads on Facebook, they might not want what, you're, what you have to sell. They might not be interested at all. But the reason that social media and Facebook ads work at all is because of the algorithms behind it. You know, Facebook has a profile for every single person that's using it. And let's say it shows an ad to a thousand people and one person ends up buying or whatever. Facebook looks at that person that bought and then does its best to show that ad to more people that are just like that one person. And the more times it works, the better that it will work. Um, but the key to this is having a really great offer because if you just, like on Google Ads, for example, um, I typed in remodeling contractor, the ad just says remodeling contractors. So it's just literally showing me what I'm looking for. But on Facebook, if you just had remodeling contractors, that's all your ad said, people would just breeze right over it. They wouldn't even notice. Um, your, your offer has to be something special, something that catches people's attention, something that people would feel dumb not clicking on or not buying. And I've run tons of offers on Facebook for various companies. The best, the best offer that I, I've ever used was, excuse me, for a window installer, a window sales, per, sales company. And their offer was locally made windows installed for half the price. And that offer did really well because people who were in the market for windows couldn't pass up the opportunity to spend half as much to get the same quality of windows. Um, but something, something that isn't special or isn't generic or that is generic is just not going to really work. So those are just some things to keep in mind. Which one should you use? It mostly depends on the offer that you're making. Um, I would say that search ads is better for just general marketing, like people searching for a water well driller or a remodeling contractor. You put up your ad that says well driller, contractor, whatever. That can work in the long term, and once you get it working, it will work forever. Where Facebook ads is more apt for something like a short term promotion or a special or something that you can offer people that is so good that they can't refuse it. Um, so depending on your situation will determine which one you use, but a robust marketing strategy will test both. And so the key to testing these things is tracking the results, knowing what the numbers are. And that is our next subject. So we talked about being easy to be found online. Uh, we talked about advertising and 
you know, how you can use advertising to essentially buy customers. Um, so let's talk about the numbers a little bit. Because I would, I would say that numbers is probably the most important thing out of all of this. If you get anything from this entire presentation, it's that there, there's numbers that exist in your business, whether you are actively investing in marketing or not. And if you can know what those are, um, it will, it'll give you a lot of flexibility when the market changes, when the economy goes up, goes down. Um, so this is the kind of the core subject of this article that I have coming out next month. And this one, it's, it's, I love this topic because I struggled with it forever. You know, as a marketer, this is like kind of marketing 101 type stuff, but it's something that's really difficult to conceptualize unless you've actually done it. Um, and at the end of the day, it's about inputs and outputs. How much money can you put in to the front of your business and how much can you get out of the other side? And if you can figure out how to put money in the front, then you can make changes and tweaks throughout the entire process and change what comes out the other side. So I'm gonna tell a little story about my dad. Um, a few years ago, my dad, Norm, Kyle, he's a remodeling contractor. He was um, experiencing a slow period in winter, which is pretty common. And um, knowing that I had a marketing company, he called me one day and said, hey, can you help me get some more customers? Like, do whatever you do. And so we decided to advertise for him on Google. And after a few weeks, I think it was like three or four weeks of advertising, he had spent about $1,000. And I'm gonna round these numbers just to make it really simple. So he spent about $1,000 and he got three customers out of it. And he actually got like five or six phone calls, but you know, some of those, I don't think all of them became estimates and of the estimates he did, he acquired three jobs. Um, and from those three jobs, he made about $10,000. So in this example, he spent $1,000, put it into the front end and got 10,000 out from the other side. And so he, he had a 10 to one return on his investment in, in advertising, which is really good. You know, if, 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 if I could figure out how to put $1,000 in a box and get 10,000 out, I'd be doing that all day long, right? So let's look at the same story if there was an economic downturn, if the market got more challenging. So same situation, he's slow, he needs more work, he decides to advertise, he spends the same thousand dollars, but this time it's a lot harder to acquire customers. So he only gets one customer from that thousand bucks. Um, and from that one job, he makes about $3,500. So he sees about a three to one return on his investment this time, which is not nearly as good, but it's a lot better than having zero customers. So let's look at the next month uh, the story of Norm during an economic downturn, but this time he knows his numbers and he has experience with advertising and he just knows how it works for his business. So he knows that it takes about $1,000 to acquire a customer. And so this month he decides to triple down and spend $3,000 and acquire three customers. And he makes the same $10,000 as he did in the first, the first example. Um, but this time he spent three times as much doing so. And so he still sees about a three to one return on his investment. He made about $7,000 at the end of the day. And this is a super simplified example of how advertising works when you understand the numbers. It's literally, you figure out how much it costs to acquire customers, and then you can determine how many customers you need and invest the appropriate amount. But in order to do that, you need to know that you're gonna get money out the other side and that, and that it's gonna work out for you. And I think, um, I think the, the biggest thing that holds people back is not, um, not the money, like people have money to invest in this stuff, but it's that they aren't sure that it's going to work for them. And <laughs> so, you know, that, that's, just, that's just the way it is. So, um, knowing how much your CPA is, cost per acquisition, like Norm did, he was spending $1,000 to acquire a customer. 
and knowing what your average profit is per customer. And in the marketing world, we use the term lifetime value because you might acquire a customer today, but maybe your average customer will come back in three years or so and hire you again to do something else. And if you keep really good records of all of your customers, then you should have the means to figure out what the lifetime value of a customer is. Um, and there's tons of business models out there where the cost per acquisition is more than the profit from one job. So they actually lose money on the first job, but the lifetime value of a customer is more because that customer comes back over and over again. And so they end up making um, a profit on the second, third, fourth tra uh, transaction after that. So that's just something to keep in mind that um, if you can figure out the lifetime value of your customers, that's another number that can be really uh, helpful. Um, so with those numbers, the cost per acquisition and what your profit is, you should have a like be able to name a price, like how much can you afford to pay to acquire a customer? And that's the number that you give to your marketing team and you say, hey, I can afford this much, like get me customers for less than this. And, and then that's their goal. You have a concrete goal. It's easy to tell whether they're meeting it or not. And with all these things in place, you can adjust the dials and hopefully reduce the cost per acquisition and increase the profit and, and just make this work as good as possible. And these are the things that will fluctuate when the economy changes. It might get more expensive to acquire customers or you might not make as much profit from a customer. So knowing where these boundaries are is super important. And I'll, I just say from experience of my own experience and working with tons of people, this stuff does not work very well when you're in a desperate situation. It's kind of like um, in playing in the stock market with money that you can't afford to lose. You end up making emotional decisions and just not getting very good results because you're in a desperate spot. And I know a lot of folks, at least over the last year or two, are super busy. You know, pretty much all construction companies in my area are have been slammed for two years. My family's company's been booked out for a couple years. Um, I've worked with and talked to groundwater contractors across the country, and most people are very busy. And so, tr you know, trying to figure out customer acquisition when you have too many customers doesn't seem like the best use of your time, you know? But I would say it's better to do this stuff. It's better to figure out how this stuff will work for you when times are good uh, than, rather than waiting until you're in a desperate situation. And I'll just use a quick story of a, another client of mine, Aaron Lundy. Um, you know, his whole career, he had always come from a place, not of desperation, but of needing, needing his customers more than they needed him. And so he ended up doing a lot of jobs that maybe weren't the right fit for what he was trying to do or didn't pay the rates that he wanted to charge. And it wasn't until he really hit a gold, gold vein in his customer acquisition and just had too many opportunities coming in that he experienced how awesome it is to be able to say no to the, the customers or the jobs that are not a, the right fit. Um, and being able to charge rates that that he, that he wanted to charge, and so I would say even if you have enough customers, it ne it's never bad to have more opportunities. And while times are good, you know it's a good time to experiment with things like advertising, or to build up your your uh, standard marketing base, like your website and being on Google Maps and stuff like that. Um, build those things up when times are good and it's just adds a little bit of cushion and maybe gives you a little bit of extra opportunity so that you have uh, you know you can make better decisions but then when the economy inevitably turns you're in such a better position to to figure out what to do and to you know hopefully do more than just get by um, when when all the other companies are retract you know contracting all their spending and cutting their advertising and all that it just opens up the market for it opens up the opportunity for you to come in and 
really apply what you've learned with advertising and marketing and things like that. So the three areas that we covered is be easy to find online or be easy to be found online and build that baseline of customers that are coming in all the time. And then on top of that foundational layer, figure out how to buy customers. There's so many different advertising methods out there. You, you don't have to use Google and Facebook, even if those are maybe the main ones online, but there's certainly gonna be local uh, things you can do. There's offline marketing like billboards or uh, sending out mailers or you know um, decals and stuff on your trucks, all of that kind of stuff. Build that stuff up, get good at it when you know when times are good and and you'll be good. And start tracking your numbers. Like hopefully most people listening to this are at least tracking most of this stuff already. Maybe um, you haven't dove into the numbers and really figured out like, okay, how much are we paying to acquire a customer or or things like that. But the when it comes down to it, and let's say there's three companies competing on Google ads for the same pool of customers, whoever can afford to pay the most to acquire a customer is going to win those customers. And so knowing how much you can afford to do that, that that's imperative. If you don't know, then you're going to be taken for a ride by the, the people that do know that. <laughs> so uh, with, with these three things in mind, um, definitely do some more research on this stuff think about it um, but if you can scratch off the customer acquisition problem then you're you'll be doing all right uh, there might be other problems that come up in an economic downturn but I would argue that the most important one is is, is solved so uh, 